Kelly, your house is amazing. Thank you. I mean, it's just breathtaking. I know I've been here before, but every time I come, I see something else wonderful tucked away in a little corner or up on a wall somewhere. It's just amazing. Thank you. I mean, that's the weird thing about, I think, about good design is that you, you can go into a space and you can experience it. And then every time you go back, somebody says, is that new? And you go, no, because for me, the home is, is a discovery. You're constantly finding and seeing new things because you can't take everything in at once. And the home is all about the experience that you feel in it and your memory, you know, your childhood memories. Like for me, was my grandmother's home was very much the kind of the core of who I am today because of the experiences that I had there. So that's what I've always tried to recreate in people's homes over 41 years. And I mean, when you look at it, it's all so beautifully put together. And it looks as though it'd be relatively simple to do, but I can't imagine how difficult it is. Well, it's simple for me, but having done so many books to try and share all my knowledge with people, which I decided to do many years ago, uh, rather than kind of store it all up in my own head, because so many people would come to me and say, but how do you do that? Yeah. When you actually dissect one room, most people think it's floors, walls, curtains, sofa, chairs, lights. But there's probably a good 38, 39, 40 things to think about in a room, and it is really hard. Plus... It's not like buying clothes where you try it on, you look in the mirror and you, no, it doesn't work. You know, yeah. I'm too tall, I'm too thin, I'm too fat, and whatever it is. It's like a room has to kind of fit you and your family and the people and how you want to live, but it's the scale of it. So it's very, very daunting. So it's, it's a really hard thing to do, and yet it's the most important part of your life is where you fall Absolutely. asleep and wake up. Because it's so smart, but yet so comfortable and welcoming. And I think that's got to be one of the biggest tricks you have isn't it yeah I think so I mean I you know I often lie in bed when I can't sleep and I redesign everything and I move <laughs> furniture around and think I wish I could be more scrunchy and a little bit less formal but and yet we live in it like if somebody said to me how do you feel you live I, I'd be like so chilled and relaxed my kids would all turn around and go really you've got a white sofa you you know so yeah. my vision of how I like to live is quite interesting in terms of how I then get into clients' heads because how you think you live isn't exactly how you need to. Yeah. And that's always been my magic, is trying to get into someone's head and extract the information. I remember Jo Malone once said when I did her apartment years ago, she said, you've given me what I didn't know I wanted, but I knew I wanted. You yes. know, it's like it's finding that little in. tiny thing because I believe everyone knows how they want to live. They just don't know how to make it happen. And that's why they and that's call what, you. And that's why <laughs> yeah. I love what, you know, why I've done it for so many years and still jump out of bed and feel very passionate about it and excited. Well, there's no doubt you're very good at it. Were you always good at it? Um, I think I've got better. I think when I, when I was very little, um, my mother said I used to literally, she'd go out for dinner, <clears throat> she'd come back, and I would have literally pushed furniture around. And <laughs> I was always tidying up. She was quite messy, and I always used to lay things out in my bathroom I remember laying all my bottle I was very I loved home and I on weekends my mum would say what do you want to do because my brother was at boarding school and I'd say I want to go and see show flats I was obsessed with the before the after people's homes and I think when I first started I wasn't good at design when I look back at it but I definitely had that drive that tenacity that focus that passion that belief that I could do it and it wasn't long until I came up with East Meets West and kind of got that confidence that that's who I was. And then I think I was OK. But you started really young, yeah. didn't you? 16 and a half. It, was that when you left school to go into work or you left school and then fell into work? Well, my father was killed and uh, I was really completely... It, it was like the worst surprise of my life. I just thought my parents would be with me forever at that age. And he was very sick and he was given the wrong medication and he died and it was horrific. And I ran away to South Africa and hooked up with a, a band there and was thrown in jail. You didn't jail. have any family in? Well, I did, but I, I ran away thinking no one would find me. But of course, my mother was on, you know, found me walking down Sea Point in South, you know, South Africa. It's at Cape Town. It's not and let's exactly... Just rewind. You ended up in jail? So I was with a multiracial 
banned and it you know there was apartheid then and so I was traveling around and I was a backing singer this is for a few months <laughs> I can't and, imagine this you know living on chip butties and and literally I can't imagine that either yeah and knowing how of, healthy you are kind of got lost into a world because I was so shaken by my father's death my mother found me and I said mum I'm not coming home and she said you need to come home I said so we had a big argument and we took a trip through the Karoo and, and we ended up somewhere and I booked all of them into a hotel. And of course, that wasn't allowed. And we spent a night in jail. And it, when I left South Africa then to finally come home, um, I didn't go back for many, many years. I was so, I was so young, but I still understood it wasn't right. Yeah. Um, but it was, a, it was a real turning point for me because I was angry, I'd lost my father, I, was, I felt very alone. Um, and I, I suppose my tenacity and my ability to start a business that young was a kind of survival, like I will never rely on anyone ever again in my yeah. life. I was so angry. And I think that drove me to become, you know, really successful you know, um, earned my own money. I everything that I've done and bought, I've done myself because I was so frightened that I would ever have to rely. But in the same it's time, independent. Yes, that, that you, you know, you lose your vulnerability. So probably throughout my life and, and some of tougher. the things that I did, I might have not done had I not been like that. I now am vulnerable and I've grown up, and it's different. But that time was really difficult for me, and I was a real loner. Um, and I was just focused. I worked, you know, seven days a week, you know, through the night. And I was self-taught. And so that all came out of that little journey of me going over there and meeting these wonderful people. And, you know, I love music and I love jazz and funk. And, and, so, and I still design to that kind of music. So that was a very kind of pivotal time for me. But the strength of character it must take at 16 to leave home and go to South Africa um, and not come back at the demands of your mother and then come back and start a business. I mean, that shows a real strength, real backbone yeah, through I you. I don't know what, I, you know, I, I, sometimes I can transport myself back to that time and there was, there was a very frightened little girl inside but there was this, I have this extraordinary imagination, so I can create scenarios in my head and I can make believe. I've always been able to visualize, which is one of the reasons I'm good at what I do, because I can, this room can be empty and I can see it finished. So I can create fantasies. So probably a lot of my life then was a fantasy in my head, but I actually turned it into a reality. And there's an art in that, I think. And that's from um, just, pure and utter determination and my mother's a very strong character and I love her so much and we're great great friends now but we went through a very tough time because when my father died I hadn't seen her for a year so I, I felt very alone so I kind of when I was in South Africa and I attached myself to these people who didn't know who I was, they had no idea who my grandfather was, who was this highly successful businessman in South Africa. I was just this girl with red hair who just loved music, loved to dance. And was, was a good singer. Was a good singer <laughs> and was blown away by this underground, knew it was naughty and it was bad, but wanted to be that way. And I don't know, it kind of... I, I've always had that thing where I liked things that weren't quite normal. But if I take a step back and I look at that, that could have gone one way or the yeah. other, couldn't it? I mean, you were right then on the cusp of take going left and... Sliding doors. Yeah. You know, or one of my favourite films yeah. is that thing of, you know, it's just brought shivers down me. You know, you can go one way and your life goes this way and you go the other way and it can completely go, like, so wrong. But... I, my father was an extraordinary man, a, a great businessman. My mother is the most amazing woman who's still working at the age of 80. My grandfather was extraordinary. I come from good genes, and I think I was brought up to work and, and you know, to succeed. And I like, I like to succeed. It's one thing that I, I like. You know, if I go into a competition, I want to win it. I want to be the best that I can. And, you know, I used to use that analogy with the kids when they were doing exams and swatting for exams. I'd say, close your eyes, visualize opening that envelope, and you failed. What does it feel like? Now, next day, open that envelope, visualize what it's like to win. Hold on to that, because that is what you're going to be able to achieve. And that was something I learned as a child. Um, 
And also having been bullied so badly at school, leaving school and doing all of that, I was very much in my own little head. But I think, in a way, I'm quite glad of that because it enabled me to be the person that I am today. So you, you, you come back, you set up a business as an interior designer. Yeah. And how do you get into work at 16? So it's always a friend of a friend. So my stepfather had a friend that he was in the war with, or the Air Force or something, and um, he wanted to have a kitchen done. And it was in Elveston Mews, next to my old school, El- Elveston Place. And I designed the most hideous kitchen that ever existed. <laughs> it was brown but he and it liked was it. horrible. He was an alcoholic, so was the builder I found. <laughs> And everything was hung upside down and whatever. But that was my first job. And from there, I met somebody who was having an affair with a Grand Prix racing driver who loved interiors. And she said, why don't we just help him? And of course, it ended up being mine. I found a builder. The driver that drove for my building um, business was Damien Hill. Oh, wow. When we laugh about it now, (laughs) nothing was late arriving. And I built a business. And... In those days, you didn't have Instagram, you didn't have, you know, Google, you didn't have the internet. It was word of mouth. I got in my car, I drove, I found, I designed, I pulled things together, and I built this infrastructure of actually networking and meeting and talking to people. And, And it was good. And I remember the second job that I did was picked up by House and Garden, and and that was it. I I kind of never looked back. And Every job I got was word of mouth because I never, I was too frightened to tell who I was working for because they were all famous at that point for some reason. And that stayed with me my whole life. So unless somebody said I'd done their home, I never ever spoke who I worked for. So it was literally word of mouth. And that's how the business started. But there's one thing being a very talented interior designer because there's lots of those. And there's another having the this business wonderful man. global brand that covers everything from buildings to cruise ships to jewellery to home accessories. Mm. You've got the most fantastic website where we can buy, we can own a little bit yeah. of the Kelly Hop and style. I mean, that's a whole different thing altogether. When did you realise actually you were really good at business and you could build this global platform? Well, I think that I was interested in everything. And, you know, Conran was, was somebody that I looked up to, um, you know, that I've known all my life. There were certain iconic people, Joseph Ettegi, I used to go and see every Saturday and we would talk, Anya Heimat, you know, yeah. there was a group of us that were all just hungry, not so much for making money. That was never the main objective for me. It was, it was to produce and to be able to kind of create this amazing network and and this business and I guess I was very good at and I, I, I realized at a young age that PR was a very good thing and I went to a very small company and I said look this is me I want to start getting my work out there and so I was I was quite smart in that thinking and then brands started coming to me like Wedgwood and people saying well, we'd like to do a licensing deal I then read up everything I could on Martha Stewart you know, so I was hungry to read and learn. So I was, was doing that. And kind of overnight, and I say overnight, over a period of two years, it, Kelly Hoppen became an adjective. This is very Kelly Hoppen. Yep. I remember reading that as if it was yesterday and thinking, <coughs> oh, I yeah, like that. that's me. And then it became a brand. And it kind of just escalated from there. And it became very global. I had a store in Bergdorf Goodman and all the Neiman Marcuses, you know, Fox offered me a daytime show, but I decided I didn't want to leave London. You know, there were all these opportunities and I was able to do them all. I had this enormous amount of energy and I could compartmentalize things in my head. And I worked late into the night to be able to do it and bring up a family. I mean, you've got teams all over the world working on all these amazing projects, which is very different to working on your own and driving yeah, around and doing easier. little projects. Um, well, I don't know. Is it easier yeah. to manage a huge team than it is to... Well, managing a huge team, I remember Anya once saying to me, it's very lonely being a boss. It is. You know, you think you're everyone's friend, but the, the, the bottom line is you're not. You're their boss. Yeah. But I, I'm good at creating a team that are all very like-minded. So I'm very lucky that my 
office is large, but that everybody gets on really well outside of school. But I think it's easier when you have your soldiers, and I call them my soldiers, my tribe, who all have the same vision, they're, they're passionate, they love every project. And a long, long time ago, I worked with a life coach called David Zellman in New York, who, who said to me, if you want to grow your business, you think you're at the top, but you've got so much further to go. And I went, really? I think I'm there. And he went, no, 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 no. He said, you've got to be, that's you at the top, the umbrella, but you have to allow everybody underneath you to be their own boss so that it grows. You have to share all your knowledge and write your books and, and be generous with everything. And that's how the business kind of grew. And if you've got a team that you, you really um, respect, and so there's this mutual respect, and you give them just enough and you can delegate, you have a really strong team, and then it's easier. When you work for yourself and you're doing your own home, I'm the client from hell. So I'm not <laughs> I can only imagine. working for myself, living with myself, I'm to dream it myself. It's horrible. But when it's someone else, I just know. It's just an instinct. And so it's, it's, I'm not saying it's easy. It's, we've got a lot of projects and it's, it's a pressure cooker at times. But I've learned with age that you have to just sit down and you have to go, okay, this is not a serious world problem. This is something we can sort out, and you talk it through, and, and the calmer you are, the easier it is to, to deal with things. I mean, I know you well, and I'm very proud to call you my friend. You're a great friend. And one of the things I admire about you is your inner strength, your absolute calmness in approach to everything, and your absolute desire to win. You mm. are perhaps the most competitive next to me person I ever know. I, if we ever played a game of anything, <laughs> I think there could be blood on the floor because whilst we're friends, we're both very competitive. But there must have been ups and downs in growing this business. It can't have all been, or was it all just progression, progression, progression? No, but I think you know as well as I do that when, you, when you're an entrepreneur, this word that's used so, you know, everywhere now, but, but it, it is a trait Yes, I failed so many times, but I, I just let it go. I push it, I go, it's finished, on to the next. There's always something else that can replace something that didn't work. Not with people, but with things and businesses. And I think that when you've got the mind like we have, you already got those things burning. So it's not like you're looking for it. You've got all these antennae out. And yes, things don't come off all the time but instinctively I've always known when those things are not going to work. I'm, I, I'm a real woman when it comes to that instinctive Deepak Chopra moment where you get that oh that's not right. So you prepare yourself so even though I seem quite laid back my feet like are like this many many times you know and I think you need those things that don't work to give you the strength and it also often makes you look at things in a different way that open up doors in different channels but I'm, I'm very forward thinking and I'm always looking from the outside in to look at what we look like, what we're doing, what do people think we're doing, what is it that people want, how can we approach things in a different way. There's always different ways and actually I think it's that kind of mind map in my head that's kept me so much given me so much enjoyment to keep on going because sometimes I wake up and I think I can't believe I'm still loving this yeah you know like is this really real have I lucked out am I just the luckiest girl in the world that 41 years later I still love it um, I don't love running every single tiny thing of the business because I've got a great team but I still get passionate about getting that feeling when you meet someone and going now this is something I'm going to love designing this or I'm going to love giving this talk or mentoring this young kid or whatever it is and I think it's because I'm always thinking of new things it never it, it never sleeps this brain I think when I hear that what I think I'm hearing which I love about you is that you're still ambitious yeah there's no sort of limit to where you think you can go no and I think for the people listening to this podcast I think it's really important to know that to be ambitious for yourself to get the career yeah. that you want and to be, keep pushing and be yourself. open about it yeah. my motto my screensaver is nothing's too big but nothing's ever big enough and people always laugh at me but it's not that it's like uh, I think it's really hard today for kids with Instagram and social media. I know we have to have it, but I think it's so difficult. When I started, there was none of that. So what I designed came out of my imagination, my travels, 
And I didn't know that the guy next door was doing as well as I was or whatever. I just was proud of what I was doing. And I think that you have to look within to have that ambition and to be open. It's okay to be ambitious. Yeah. It's okay to want to win. It's okay to make money. You can be charitable. You can do all the things that balance it all out, but you don't have to talk about it. But I think it's everybody has the possibility to be great in the world. Some people don't have the opportunity, so people like the Prince's Trust will help them give them that opportunity. I had a great mentor in my mother. I had a good support system. Some people don't. But in your mind and in your being, you have that ability. And I think that today there are so many great opportunities for young people. I just think it's different. And so the likes of us doing what we're doing here, Joe Malone, people that have you know, had tough times getting to where we've got. It hasn't always been easy. I think that it's great because it gives people this feeling that, yeah, I could do that. But even if it's just little baby steps, people often say to me, God, you've come so famous so quickly. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I get my gray hair done every four weeks. <laughs> Trust yeah. me, this is not quickly. This is hard, organic, slow slog. And that's the piece of advice I would give, that this whole celebrity hello, this whole thing where people go on a show on reality television and become famous, that's fine. I'm not knocking it. But that's not what we're talking about here. This is about building all the layers of a business and having the foundations that give you that secure foundation so that you can fall occasionally, but then you go back because you've got your foundations. And I think you're right that nothing really compensates for hard work no. and building anything that is sustainable and has the ability to grow takes an enormous amount of hard work 100 i mean i admire you i mean you're one of my iconic women you know i sort of watch what you've achieved and you're the same we're very much the same we come across as these kind of hard business women but you know you cut us we bleed like everyone yeah. else we have families we have grandchildren we have kids stepkids ex-husbands, husbands, you know, we've all been through stuff, but those are the things that make us the people we are. So the scars that we hold are the things that have made us better. They've made us more understanding to other people. The fact I'm a grandmother now makes me more understanding to women in my business that have babies. Mm. You know, everything you experience in life opens another door. And I think if you can embrace that and you can use that to grow your business and grow your friendship and your relationships. I think it, it's, only, it's, it's a good thing, it's a good lesson. I wanna hear more about your work with the Prince's Trust because I know you're so passionate about mm -hmm. it and I know you think it's very important and the help that it gives young people. If someone is thinking about starting a business and doesn't know where to get any potential funding, that's a good way, isn't it? Well, you first of all, I'll come to the Prince's Trust, you've got UKTI. And they're very good with giving out small amounts of money, and, but also giving people direction of who they can go and talk yep. to in terms of business. And they really, really do help. The Prince's Trust for me, I mean, there's so much at the moment on Prince Charles and how forward thinking he was all of those years ago. And what an extraordinary man. But I was drawn to it because he really was making a difference. And to date, they've helped 900,000 people. And it's just giving people that infrastructure, but not once, going back to check and to yeah. check and to check. And all of the people, and I haven't met 900,000 of them, but the amount of people I've met and I've listened to and the stories and the, the, the most horrific struggles that I couldn't even in my wildest dreams imagine what Even that... when you're in jail in South yeah, Africa. Yeah, because I was okay. I had a family. Yeah. I, you know, it was like... That was just an experience as a teenager. This is just like the worst things that could happen to you. And somebody comes along and says, we believe in you, we're gonna help you. And, and that might be the first time they've heard ever those Ever in their life, yeah. you know, and whether they've been on drugs or they've got, they're living on the streets or they've been abused or whatever it is. And so that's why I'm so passionate about them. And, and I've supported them for years and will continue to do it because it's one charity that I know really makes a difference. To, to young people or old people like yes. myself you it's, know. I think it's it's incredible I mean if I was um, if I was listening to this and I had an idea for a business and I was passionate and relatively determined what advice would you give to someone starting out on how to keep motivated to grow something to be the best at it well I think first of all going back to the whole sort of 
social media thing, you've got to kind of th think inwards and think about who you are and what you're doing. Not go and look at what other people are doing and feeling that they're doing it better. Look at who your competition is, do your research, have your facts and figures, and then go and talk to someone like UKTI or one. There, there must be so many people out there that would give advice because anything's possible. I would also say you need one person you can turn to. So if you don't have that person that you admire and that can help you, then go and look for a charity or someone that can, because you need that. I remember when I went to um, Kenya with Comic Relief to go and talk to five women who had been helped by them to start businesses. All of them said the same thing. They're, they had ideas, they wanted to succeed, but there were days where they needed to go to someone and say, if I did this or I did this, what would, which is the best way? And they were always there to help. And just having that person at the end of a phone or that you can go and meet, I think... Someone you a, can trust. You can trust. I yeah. think that is really important. You do need support. You have to. But it only needs to be one person. I mean, of all the things you've done and achieved, what... Speaking strictly business, what's been your proudest moment? What's been the moment when you thought, yeah, I've actually done really well? I, th I th honestly think, and it might be a cliche, was the, the day I, I found out that the Queen was giving me an MBE. I, I, first of all, I got the letter, and it was a brown paper envelope. And I honestly, this is the God's honest truth, thought it was tax or something. And I didn't open it until the Monday. I'm very dyslexic, but I've learned to speed read, but I often don't read properly and I opened it up and I and I just and I was like what? and I, I went back very slowly tried to be really slow in reading it and I just burst into tears and thought I wish all I kept thinking was I wish my father was alive yeah. called my mother then called my daughter and I was in disbelief because I know people talk about awards um, now and medals like it's kind of it's, it's the thing that happens. But honestly, when I got that, I just, I was like, who chose me? Why? What? You know? Yeah. And I thought, oh, maybe I am okay. And my brother said, you know, um, you've got an MBE, which stands for makes, makes beige exciting. <laughs> and uh, you've got an MBE for, you know, lampshades. And it was a joke. But actually, I was really proud of it. And I suppose that was quite late in my career as well. So i you know, people say, did you think all the way along that you were good at what you did? But not really, because I always wanted to be better. I knew I was, I was becoming successful, but I suppose that's your country. That's your queen. Yes. It's like, and I'm very into the whole royals. No, and... me too. I, I remember when I got mine. In fact, I got a phone call to say, we haven't heard from you since the letter we sent. And I said, what letter? And they said, well, we presume you're turning it down. Oh, I got no. CV. And I was like, what letter? What letter? What letter are you talking about? And I rifled through the post and I found this letter. I said, oh, no, 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 I'm definitely In accepting. a brown envelope. They need yeah. to change the yeah, colour. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's sort of like been hidden for a it's while. It's a weird feeling, and... is it? And you can't tell anyone. No, I told nobody. But I, I did. Nobody. I told a few people. And my mother said, you've told too many people. She's not going to give it to you now. And of course, I believed her. <laughs> <laughs> Snatched from the jaws of success. I know. <laughs> Was it a wonderful day for you? It was amazing. It really was. And um, I felt really humbled because the amount of people in front of me who were given uh, honours for, for such extraordinary things, you kind of feel like you're such a small little mm. person in such a big world of, of genius and, and people that have been brave and everything. I, it was amazing. And having um, had your honour built this global business, I know that lots of women out there look up to you and admire you, being a strong woman in charge of their own destiny, using your name to build this global brand. Um, obviously, we're both aware of the inequalities that are, you know, particularly when, when we were starting businesses, which is, is a long time ago, and things have changed, but they haven't changed far enough, have mm, they? Mm. Are you still... Um, concerned about that? Are you campaigning about that? Yeah. What differences do you think we can make or should be made to help? It's quite it? interesting. I uh, got up at five o'clock this morning, uh, worked out at six because I had to get into the studio to talk to a chairman in China about a project. And I'm sitting there having this Skype conversation and I suddenly realized the chairman is a woman. And it's the first chairman in China that has been a woman that I've ever spoken to, and I've done many jobs in China. Yeah. The reason I'm bringing it up is why did I have to even think that? Yeah. 
And so I turned around to the woman that works with me who does all the translations, and I said, what I want to say, Peng, is I salute you. This is amazing Yeah. Um, that this is the first chairman that is a woman. And Peng looked at me, and normally she'll give me a look if it's something she feels she can. And she, and she immediately, she didn't even doubt me. She just said it. And the woman went like this and kind of yeah. went. And it kind of brought chills up my yeah. arm because I thought, first of all, it's sad that I even had to think that. And B, I think the fact we have to still talk about it, the fact that we're, there isn't just equality in every single workplace the world is the most atrocious, most terrible thing that there is out there. I think more focus needs to be on that, more than talking about the fact that you can't have girl power, you have yeah. to have people power. Yeah. You know, that I, maybe I'm too old fashioned, I don't get that. I understand it's important to other people. But I feel if somebody is good at what they do, whether they're male or female, they should be paid the same. And I think that women have a much harder time because we have a biological clock, we want to have children. It's incredibly hard to have a baby and go straight back to work. Yeah. You Did lose... you do that? Uh, no, I took a year off, yeah, actually. Yeah, good for you. Yeah, and I'm, I'm surprised at myself, but I'm glad I had that thought that I wanted to do it. But I've watched my own daughter now, sort of 34 years later, go through it. And I think, how do women go back to work three months after and hand their little babies over to someone else? We as a government, as a country, have to support women more. But I think that it's hard when women are so ambitious, they want to start a family, and they feel that if they do that, they're going to not be able to have what rightfully is theirs. And what is your advice to, to women who are thinking of having a family and running their own businesses or even, indeed working for someone else? I think that having a child was one of the greatest things that has ever happened to me. Work is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I used to say 10, 15 years ago, women ha can have it all. I would say now, I retract that. It's much more difficult in the, in the world that we live in. It's become so competitive. Um, and I think that you have to plan it better. And I think that's a sad thing that you can't as a woman and a, and a man and a family just, just have a, a child. I think everything needs to be planned. But I think that companies need to be more focused on helping women that have children so that they can work from home, that they can come in part time. And we need to be able to support women so that we make it easier for them going forward. And I think technology has really helped, hasn't it? I mean, when Hugely. I had when I was having my kids 22 years ago, the internet and all of those yeah. things that make our life so much easier, they just didn't exist. Absolutely. You had to physically be at your, uh, you know, in, at in, your in, desk yeah. with your phone or you So you I think work. we all have to adapt. You know, I'm 60 next year. I have to adapt at the fact that if somebody wants to have a baby and work from home, I have to trust that that's going to work. Yes. Do, do you know what I mean? I and do. I think it's important. But the thing is, I don't think people realise that if you don't trust that, you'll lose the person. Absolutely. And you're missing out on the talent. Yeah. Um, as a company, you, I think you ought to be looking at how do you attract 50% of the workforce to you and you need to be more flexible and more understanding because if you're not, they just won't work Absolutely. For you. Every big company should have crushes. They should give child support you know this is the world we need to create everything is changing everything is changing around us you know if nothing is ever going to be the same again in in every respect maybe in six seven years we're all going to get that kind of plateau and it's going to calm down but right now everything's in turmoil i think the workplace needs to adapt to the world that we live in i think marriage vows are out of date you know that everything has changed and i think that we have to be more forward thinking and I think in Britain we can be that. I 100% I, I agree with you. I mean I just want to really finish on, um, I always talk about what my core values are. I left school at 18, I, I wasn't 16 but I was 18 and the one thing I wanted was the same thing as you, my independence. I've been at boarding school for a very long time mm. and when you're at boarding school you get up when you're told, you go to bed when you're told, you wear what you're told, you eat what you're told, you frankly you do what you're told and I'd had enough. I wanted to say what I wanted to do, when I wanted to do it, how I wanted to do it. And I left school at 18 and I wanted independence and I knew to be truly independent you needed your own money. But I'd worked out what my core values were. I was ambitious, I was absolutely determined and I had integrity in everything I did. And all these years later, they're still the things that make me who I am. Yeah. And I just wondered what makes you who you are? 
I think loyalty is absolutely key to me. Family is everything to me. That, that is the first and foremost. I can't function unless I know that each one of the pods of family are okay. And authenticity is really important to me. And also that kind of independence, but with the edge of vulnerability, which I've learned in later life. But those are the core, those are what I look for in people I employ. So if I don't hold those close to me and that's who I am, I don't think it works. So I think those are really, really important to me. And I guess just finally, what I'd like to know is, what next? Is, can there be anything left that you want to do? Yeah. I know you're ambitious, but if, do you, is there something you haven't done that you really want to do? Yes, 100%. I, I, you know, everybody always asks me that every year, and I, I think one day I'm going to wake up and go, no, I'm done. Yeah. But I'm not. No, <laughs> I'm <laughs> not, not. Unfortunately, not because I have been blessed to be given so many great opportunities. And as I said earlier, I'm still passionate about what I do. So I still want to do more design, but I want to grow the company so it becomes one of the biggest global companies in the world. And I'm 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 planning that at the moment. Um, I want to design a train. That's the last thing I've never done. You know, in terms of a, a space. Um, but yeah, I'm constantly thinking of new things that I want to do. I, it, it, the, this never switches off. It pretends to, but it doesn't. I've known you a long time. You're very happy, aren't you? Yeah, I am yeah, happy. I I've sort tell. of got to that point where I have my days, like yeah. all women do, where you feel a little bit insecure and you just need that hug. And but I'm, I am happy now. And you know, often I listen to women saying, "I wish I was 20 years younger." I yeah. don't because. I'm in the happiest place I've been in my life and I feel that I've got a wisdom and a knowledge now that I didn't have then and that's really important to me. I want to use that and share that with people in a way that's positive because I'm quite a, I am a very sensitive person believe it or not and I'm very affected by everything around me and I just think we need to kind of like knuckle down like all of us need to be more um, um, what's the word, like supportive of each other, community, and I don't know where that's come from, but I think it's really important today to have that, because I think we're going to need it. I don't disagree. You're amazing. So amazing. So are you. (laughs) You're more amazing. No, no, you're more amazing. (laughs) We could be here all day doing that. (laughs) So lovely. Thank you for spending the time. Thank you. And welcoming us into your wonderful home. Thank you.